Well, it's good to be with you again and to share in the Word of God. I'm thinking of some of the great figures in, that we are confronted with in Holy Scripture. Uh, thinking of the Abraham, so I mean, God said, go, leave your family, leave everything that is common and co- comfortable for you, and, and just go. And He didn't tell him where he was going. Uh, and, and just to see his act of faith and moving at God's command. Moses. Moses, uh, that, that baby that was rescued from the Nile River, uh, that man who grew up to be a leader of God's people and, and who would dare stand against Pharaoh, the, the king of uh, the, one of the most powerful kingdoms of the world there. I think of Joshua taking over for him. And, and leading God's people into the promised land. And well, David and Goliath and Elijah and 450 prophets of Baal, and he's standing against them. And we think of these great men uh, and women of God, of Peter and James and John and Paul and what they did. But I want to give us here a little bit of a, a corrective Uh, We see these people as the heroes of our Bible, uh, heroes of holy history. And uh, we need a correction here, and here's the correction that I want to offer to you. Uh, We need here to understand that the true hero of Holy Scripture and of all of history is not these great men and women of God who've stood up. It's really God. The real hero of the Bible is really God. He's the star. He's the leading character. He's the sovereign God. He's the one that is in control. He's the one who is above all. And and we need to recognize and understand that. And, And I want to point your attention to something that we often hear spoken in, in uh, services and as we talk about God, we talk about the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. What, what does that really mean? What is the sovereignty of God? I, I've just crafted a bit of a definition here. The sovereignty of God is God as creator. He made everything. A sustainer. He has uh, in, in, so wonderfully kept all the universe glued together so things don't go flying out of, out of their orbit. Um, he's the sustainer of everything. He possesses all authority. He doesn't have to answer to anyone. He has all authority. He has all wisdom. He has all power. So not only does he have the authority to do what he wants to do, he has the power to accomplish that, uh, to accomplish whatever he desires and for his own purpose. Wow, that's huge. Um, that's a picture of God. And and I just want to show you a couple places where we see this in Scripture, the sovereignty of God, and understand something about it. In in Daniel chapter 4, the the great uh, ruler over Babylonia was Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. He did not acknowledge God, and so God smote him with insanity. And for seven years, this greatest of kings... Um, is wandering, he, he's eating grass, he's got, his fingernails are grown like talons, uh, his hair is all matted, and, and he's, frankly, he's an embarrassment that they hide away. And after seven years, God restored him, his sanity to him. Listen to what he says, what he learned about God through this whole time in Daniel chapter 4. Uh, he says this, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Wow, what what an incredible testimony of this man who has confronted and seen who God really is. Hey, listen, what it says in Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in heaven. 
Here is his sovereignty. He does whatever pleases him. There are a lot of things that would please me to be able to do that I can't do. I don't have the ability or the authority, but that's not the case with God. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. You know, you think of the, the people who are in, in government, th- people who are ruling, and think, well, how, how did that person get there? I'll tell you how. God put them there. God put him there, and for his own purpose. And we, sometimes we were left scratching our heads, wondering what God would be doing with some of the people that have been leaders, but, but that's the truth. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he, he causes that king to choose whatever he wants to happen, whatever he pleases. Now listen to what Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6. This is incredible. God, the blessed and only ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, to whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Isn't that incredible? These, these pictures that we have of God and, and who he is. In Ephesians 1.11, it says this, in him, that's in Jesus, we were chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. It's what he wants to happen, he makes sure that it happened. Now, I'm convinced that we really don't know how great God is. What, what our knowledge of God is is so limited compared to who he is and what he is able to do. Uh, we can't comprehend with our finite minds how incredible this God is, how absolutely mind-shattering uh, he is in his control and his purpose for all things. Um, here, here's, what, here's some of the things that God, are, uh, God is in control of. Think of this for a second. He's in control that, in that he rules over everything. He has the power and authority over nature. <laughs> you ever see Jesus? The, there's wild storms they're caught in. They're, they're fearful of being drowned. And, and he says, be still. He has control over all nature. He has control over all kings and earthly rulers. He has control over history. In fact, he's guiding history to uh, it's determined end that he's decided for that. He's over angels and demons. He's even over Satan. Do you know that Satan can't do anything that he goes to ask permission to God for? And God will finish him uh, in, in due time as well. It's incredible uh, the, the power and the authority that he has. And I think that we don't fully appreciate this. But I want you to just think for a moment with me how important this is to us as Christians. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, one of my favorite verses um, is Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, all things good, all things tough, all things difficult, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. See, if you're a believer, if you've responded to his call, if, if, you're, if you're one of those who love him, and you're a child of God, then he wants you to know that he has control over everything in your life, everything surrounding your life, and all the things that touch your life. He wants you to know that, that in all of these things, he's working, and he's working for your good. And I know sometimes I don't feel like it's my good because sometimes I have to, I've gone through some difficult uh, times and experiences. Uh, but we, he, we come to understand that these things aren't random. Now, Gerda and I are going to be relocating to London. And uh, so we were trying to buy a house in London. And, and real estate there is crazy like it's real, the real estate is here. And uh, we're, we're trying to buy a house and we just totally committed this to the Lord. We said, Lord, we don't know what your purpose is for us in the future. We don't know what you want to do with this. 
but um, we, we trust you. And so we prayed and committed that to the Lord. And we would go and see a place and we think, yeah, that's a really nice place. We'd like to put in an offer on that. And we might be a distant third on it or we might miss it for, by, by a little bit. And, and it's frustrating. You went house after house after house after house and getting turned down. But you know what? We didn't, we didn't have, we weren't fearful. We weren't uh, despairing. We said, look, that wasn't God's place for us. We've committed this to him, and, and we trust him in that. And so house five, teaching, that was the one that God had. And so we have this, we have this uh, understanding that God is working in our lives. And uh, this, these aren't random happenings. These are done. And I don't, I don't know what the Lord will have for us, but I know that he has something for us. And I don't know who our neighbors are or what that will mean or, or any of those things. But that's, that's everything that happens in our life as Christians has, has a purpose under God. You know, listen to what Philippians 1.6 says. Uh, Paul says, being confident of this, confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, okay, will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? He started you on your journey. He called you. He warmed your heart. He opened your heart and brought you to himself. He started something with you, and, and, and he will carry it on until the day of Christ Jesus. That's, that's till he comes again. Listen to what... Uh, Philippians 2 says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. God has done something for us and he wants us to respond by living our lives the way he wants us to. But he says this, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Isn't this incre uh, incredible? That God is working, again, an affirmation. He is sovereign, he's in control, and is, he's working uh, his will to act according to his good purpose for us. And so these are, these are great uh, comforts to me uh, as I go through life knowing that God is doing this. So God is in total control and, and, uh, of this world and all that's in it. And that should provide us with incredible comfort and, uh, and uh, because we know that he's in control and he's going for our good purpose. But what I want to do is this morning, in the rest of our time, I really want to talk to you about how God's sovereignty applies to us with respect to the mission that we have as a church. We have a mission to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And um, we need to know as we go through, uh, particularly our focus has been in Luke Acts, that, that as we go through these things, that God is in control. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all working for our focus and what we do and what we are, are on. And, and, and uh, we have a mission. And in this mission, God calls us... Um, to understand his sovereignty in this area. He, he's, given us, he's given us a command. Go and make disciples of all nations. It, that's our command in, in uh, uh, going down through this. He, he's given us this holy commission. But he says, I'm going I'm to be with you. It's okay. Uh, I'm giving you a, a task that is, well, let's say impossible. But it's not impossible with me because with me all things are possible. And so I just want to show you, uh, and, and I'm going to go through some of this uh, for you uh, a, little, a little quickly. So you just, you know, hang on and, and go with us. The sovereignty of God in evangelism. The sovereignty of God, the control of God when it comes to our mission, our, our outreach. And, I, and when we look through the book of Acts, if you want to look and ask who is the hero in this, you'll come away saying the hero is God. It, it, as, as great as the people are who and wonderful who, who were a part of the, the building of the church, it's God and his fingerprints are all over the book. And uh, the first thing I just want to point out to you is this, that God has a plan. God has a plan. 
And, and this is interesting because we're confronted with this in uh, uh, all of what's happening here. Um, in Luke 1.1, 1, 1, it says that many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. So he said, uh, Luke Acts are really one work, two volumes. So the very first verse of Luke he says this, many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, they're, they're, he's writing a history of the church and, and what God is doing in this. But there's one little word in there that I want to make you uh, uh, aware of. And the one little word is this, fulfilled. First few words of the whole two volumes I'm drawing up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Well, what is he talking about when he's talking about fulfilled? He wants to uh, alert us that there are scores and scores, even hundreds of prophecies in the Bible that find themselves being worked out and coming to fulfillment. And God has a plan. God has a plan right from the beginning. See, when, when Adam and Eve failed... When they, when they uh, disobeyed God, when they rebelled against him, when they took the fruit that they shouldn't have, God didn't go like this, oh no, no, this wasn't, they, they weren't supposed to do this. God was ready and prepared for all of this. God had a plan right from the beginning, and Adam's failure and being banished from the garden was no surprise to God. He had known and pre-planned for everything. And, and what he did was he covered the nakedness of, of Adam and Eve. And this was the first picture of his saving work, slaughtering an animal to cover their nakedness. But I want you to notice something else. When, when the Apostle Paul talks about our, um, uh, about our status he says this in Ephesians uh, 1. He says, For he, that is God, chose us in him, that's in Jesus, before the creation of the world. You mean, you mean he had a plan for me before I was even born? Yes, he, he chose you before the creation of the world. He knew you. He knew your name. He knew what you would be like. And he wanted you to be holy and blameless in his sight. And in love, he predestined us to uh, be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his ple good pleasure and will. He's saying, this wasn't just, uh, oh, an oops, what do I do now? He had pre-planned all of that. Look at what it says in Revelation 13 and verse 8. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Jesus was slain from before the creation of the world. Well, he wasn't actually slain, but in God's plan, that was his way to redeem us to save us, to bring us back to himself. What about Jesus on the cross? What, what about the sovereignty of God in, in that? How do, what does that look like? Jesus' death on the cross shows us a picture of this in Acts wonderfully. Uh, Peter says in his sermon, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited, to you, accredited by God to youth by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you, you Jewish people, uh, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. It was, all, it was all in God's plan. They hated Jesus, and their hatred for Jesus played right into his plan. He, his, he gave his life for us. And what a, what a beautiful thing as we see what he is doing for us and through us, and he has it pre-planned.
You might wonder, how, does, how is it that the Bible can have all these prophecies hundreds or thousands of years earlier, and, and how is it that they can be predicted so precisely? Because God is directing everything to that end. That's the incredible thing about it. He, he, he has pre-planned that. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter gets up to give a message as to what's happening. And he says, well, listen, what, what you hear happening uh, as we talk about Pentecost today is, is this. This is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy in Joel 2. This happened hundreds of years before. And, and, and we see him filling this out. I want to talk to you for a second about the sovereignty of God and the sinner. How does a person become a Christ follower? Do they rationalize their way into faith? Do they, do they put it all together in their head and, and somehow are, are, are able to um, r- rationalize their way or convince themselves of this? Well, actually, no. So remember we said God is the, he's the hero, Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to barrel through a, a number of verses that are going to help us understand who did the saving work in us. Uh, and, and here we have in Acts 2, 39, um, he said that they would receive forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. Uh, he would, they would give the Holy Spirit for them as well. And who was it for? All whom the Lord our God would call. So God is doing something. They they didn't get forgiveness. They didn't get the Holy Spirit on some good things they did. They got it according to what the Lord, our God, will call. He called them. He he opened their hearts. He drew them to himself. As compelling and as effectual that call was, they, they were just drawn to him. He did that for them. Um, the church grew daily, it says. Um, and the, and, and how, how, did, how did this happen? Well, it was the Lord who added to their number daily those who were being saved. They started, get, get this, they started with 3,000 converts like that, one sermon. And incredible. 3,000 people were baptized and the church began. And the church continued to grow and proliferate. And he says the Lord added to the number. It was the Lord that added to their number. That's why they were there. God was working. Um, It was God in Christ who is credited with blessing the people by turning them from their sin in Acts 3.23. They're turning from their wicked ways. Who turned them from their wicked ways? It was God in Christ who turned them around. When the person was going this way, they were defying God in everything they did, and, and they got turned around. How did they get turned around? It was God in Christ who blessed them by turning the sinners around. It was God that raised up Jesus so that he might, listen to this, give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. He did this. It was God who raised up Jesus so that he might give repentance. He gave it. What does that mean? It's a gift. Repentance was a gift. Everything that is coming to us is coming according to the grace of God. The church was, wasn't obedient and they weren't reaching out to, to, to the Gentiles. They, they'd done fine in Jerusalem. They were okay in Judea. They even were able to sanction what was happening in Samaria with those half-Jews. But to go all the way and, and reach out to Gentiles, uh-uh, that was not happening. They were just not getting at it. So God did what only God can do. He gave visions, a- angelic visions. He gave words from God to this party, Cornelius, who was searching, and, and Peter, who was resisting, and put the whole thing together. God granted, listen what it says in Acts 11 and 18. God granted that even the Gentiles, uh, even the Gentiles repentance to Christ. What, what is he saying? He's saying God granted it. God gave repentance to them. Um, when the gospel was going into Europe for the first time, it was, it was God by the Holy Spirit who redirected Paul and, and uh, his entourage from going into Bithynia. No, they had a, a call, a, a vision of a man in Macedonia calling, come, help us. 
And Paul took that as a sign that he was to go there. And so one of his, his first uh, times there with them, he heard that there was this prayer meeting with a bunch of ladies down by a river. And he goes there. And it was there that he met Lydia, um, this businesswoman. And uh, uh, Paul gave the gospel to them. And Lydia became a follower, the first follower of Christ in, uh, in the, uh, Europe. And so we, we find this statement, though. How did this happen? And in Acts 16, 14, it says this, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Peter's message. The Lord opened her heart. Peter couldn't, or, or Paul couldn't open her heart, but God could. And the Lord did that. And when they went back to Pisidian Antioch, uh, where, where a number of Jew, uh, Jews, or, or excuse me, Gentiles became believers, Luke says this in Acts 13, 48, when the Gentiles heard this about the gospel uh, being available to them, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and listen to this, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. God is front and center in everything that's happened. He chose them. He worked in them. He opened their heart. He's the hero. And as much as we, uh, we appreciate the Apostle Paul and all these other leaders, God is the leader. He, he goes to the, the uh, city of Corinth. He's there in Corinth for some time. And uh, he's, having, uh, he's having a lot of opposition here. And here's what, here's what Jesus told him in the night in Acts 18 and 10. He said, don't be afraid, Paul. I, I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this place. Paul, he says, you know, I know you got a lot of opposition, but, but hang on, don't be afraid. Keep doing what you're doing. I have people here. I have people that... I want to bring into my family. At the Jerusalem council, when they're trying to figure out what to do with the Gentiles, the apostle Paul would tell them, it was through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we're saved, just as they are. It was grace. What does that mean? It means that we're saved, not by our efforts, but we're saved by God's gracious outreach to us and our putting our faith in him. And, uh, and it's not of works so that none of us can boast. I want you to think, we talked last week about uh, the Apostle Paul. You, here's the guy that we said, he's impossible. There's no way this guy would ever become a Christian or follower of Christ. Um, he's going to be on us and we've got to stay away from him. And God showed, there's, there's no nut that's too hard for me to crack. There's nothing in him. It's, it's only we see the sovereign work of God. And I want to I wanna move past there to the sovereignty of God and the evangelist. We've seen that God is at work to bring people to himself. God has chosen us to represent him. He's chosen us to be his ambassadors. He's chose, uh, chosen us to speak his word. And, and I, I don't get this, frankly. It, seemed like, it seems like a plan that is doomed to fail. God is relying on partnering with us so that he would do the heavy lifting, but we've got to share the message. We've got to live the message and all of that kind of thing. And, 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 and to me, I mean, look at how unreliable we can be. Uh, look at how intimidated and how fearful and lazy and self-centered and thoughtless and, and, and lacking compassion. H how is God expecting to do his work, to fulfill his mission with people like us? I, I know my fal falters and, and, and failings. Um, it doesn't sound like a good plan, except this awesome, powerful, sovereign God is the one who commanded us Go make disciples of all nations. <laughs> and lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. I will be with you. Is it a good plan? Oh, it's his plan, and that's how he's chosen to work. And, and I want to encourage you in this. This is the God who said, you will receive power. 
power, dynamite, after the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We don't have time to survey all of what the Holy Spirit does in the book of Acts. But it, it, we, when we read through, we see that God, in every instance, is the healer. And I want you to know that God never asks us to do something that he doesn't equip and empower us for. And Paul and Barnabas report back to the church at Antioch. And, and they, uh, they want, they, they'd been sent out by that church, and so they're going after their missionary journey to come back and tell them that what has happened. And on arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported, listen, all that God had done through them and how God had opened a door to the faith to faith for the Gentiles. It was God. God had done this. They were, they were servants. And, and, and I know this can be so daunting for us. Uh, we're looking for spectacular people, gifted people, people who can really do something. And, and we would see that as a very small fraction of the people in the church. But that wasn't how it was supposed to be. It, it was supposed to be for all of us that all of us would be engaged in that, that we would be an army of missionaries and, and people who are sharing the good news. I was deeply touched when I'd heard the story of Philip Johnson. He was a law professor at uh, UC, uh, U, uh, University of California, Berkeley campus. Um, he was going through some uh, breakup of his marriage. He was, uh, he was on the, the law faculty, uh, a brilliant lawyer. And uh, here he is uh, now with his two kids, his wife, kids are going back and forth. And uh, he, his kids wanted to go to this program at a church, a daily vacation Bible school, uh, a, a club, just like uh, some of what we do. And uh, he went to, for his kids to watch their little program, and the pastor got up at the conclusion of that and, and just gave a very simple uh, invitation to trust Christ. You know, God used that child's thing to take this intellectual, highly intellectual person to open his heart and to trust Christ. You see, God loves working through people who we wouldn't give credit, credit or credence to. That's the beautiful thing of, of children. We shared uh, something uh, several weeks ago of, of somebody here in our church family, uh, by extension, who spoke. It was, it was a 12-year-old granddaughter who spoke to a man near to his deathbed to say, Grandpa, I don't want, I don't want to you not to be with us. And, and God used that child, a 12-year-old child, to bring this man to faith in Christ. God's not looking for spectacular people. He's not looking for people who, who are, are just uh, the, the top of the heap. He'll take anybody who is open to offering willingly and humbly what they have to the Lord and allowing him to work through that. And they give all credit to God because they know they couldn't do that. They know they're not up for that. What do, we, what do we learn from this? I think we learn a few things. We learn that we can't do it on our own. It's only in God's strength that we're able to do this. No one can become a Christian unless God does it. We, we, we can't do it on our own. And, and that's a sobering a reminder. I know at times I, I've shared the gospel with somebody, and I, I'm thinking, boy, you are good. And God's going, son, I don't think, I think we're missing something here. But, but when we rely on him, when he's the hero, when we recognize that only he can do it, not only, not only do we understand we can't get it, we, we have, because of our inability, we, we want to pray. We understand it's God's work. We understand we can't do it. We come before him in, in our own poverty and say, 
Lord, I can't do this. Would you help me? Would you, would you help me to see that who you want me to talk to or how I can show your love to this one or that one? We need to pray. Thirdly, we need to be optimistic. If God is doing it, and this God, and, and as I said, how big is your God? Or how small is your God? He, he says to us that, hey, come and partner with me. I'll do the heavy lifting, but I need you to work alongside with me. And if it's God's plan, and if it's God's power, look out, because God can do something with anyone. Get out there and share. If God be for us, who can be against us, right? And, and so we're called to have this sense of expectancy and optimism that God can and will do as we put ourselves out there. And fourthly, we can neither take the claim uh, or the credit or the blame. Do you know sometimes we say, oh, oh, he led this person to the Lord. I led this person. Look, at it's, it's about me. It's, it's not about me. It, it's, it's not about taking the credit. Because, and it's not about taking the blame. Because when a person doesn't trust Christ, we, we can't beat up on ourselves and say, you know, if I'd only done it better, if I'd only said this, if I'd only, no, you can't, you can't do that. You're, you're but a servant. You're a mouthpiece. The heavy lifting is done by God. And fifthly, believing that only God can save and keep us, um, save us, and, and, and he's able to keep us from inscrutable methods or pressure. Do you know you see people, and they so want somebody to become a follower of Jesus that they, they put high level of pressure on them. Uh, you know, it's like a, like a salesman, like a high, high pressure sales uh, deal going on. And, and it also keeps us from using unpalatable means, like trying to help God. If we did this and this and that and the other thing, we'd help God. No, you see, when we understand this, uh, we don't have to use means and methods that were, would not uh, be what God would want for us. So don't try to make the message more palatable. Don't try and take out the things that embarrass you. Give the message. In, in, in all of its fullness for God to be able to work through that. The people understand how big and how awesome God is uh, and how great his heart is, the expanse of his heart, uh, that he formulated a plan to reach alienated sinners, that he would make a way to forgive and to accept people into his family, and that he invites us to join him in that miss mission. He doesn't, have another, he doesn't have another methodology but us. And he wants us to recognize that he's able to use us, no matter how small or insignificant we are, to change, to touch our world through Jesus one life at a time. And the problem for some of us is we aren't trusting him. We don't see his greatness. We question whether he could really do that. We need to correct that. Our God is too small for some of us. He is sovereign, and he does what we cannot do. Glory be to his name. And so I want to encourage you to, in, in, to um, offer your meager gifts, your talents, your time, your resources, to engage with God in his work, in his mission. Because it's God who can turn the world upside down that we've been talking about. So I want you to reach out, to talk to somebody, to pray, to invite them, to share your story, to share the gospel. God will do the, the uh, doing and the acting and the saving, and he'll get the credit, for he alone can do it. And he'll reach out through us one life at a time. Father, I thank you so much for all of what you have done and, and what you have chosen. And Lord, I recognize my own inability on my own uh, problems that I, I'm not always who I should be. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us all in this family, this church family, to recognize how incredibly wonderful and awesome you are, oh God, how powerful and sovereign you are, and that you choose to use us. And we have the greatest joy seeing you use us for your glory. 
And so, Father, I just pray that you would, in a very wonderful way, touch our lives as your people to reach out to others. And I pray for anybody under the sound of my voice who you are maybe coming to understand God is a lot bigger than what you gave him credit for. And you can meet him as judge or you can meet him as your savior and your heavenly father. And I just pray, Father, that that you will move upon hearts even now. The people would put their trust in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.